Welcome everyone. Welcome to the symposium session, Careers for Linguists, Linguists for Careers. And if you've come for a three hour event, which should give you some idea about the career paths that linguists can take using the skill sets that they were trained in, in business, in government, in nonprofit organizations, in tech, you are in the right place. If you have students you need to advise about career paths and resources, you're in the right place. If you're a student who's wondering what can you do with linguistics beyond academia, you are in the right place. And we're going to give you a great starter kit of resources and ideas and optimism that there are so many ways that you can employ linguistics outside of academia in fulfilling career paths. This session, Careers Outside Academia, What Faculty Should Know, is geared towards our faculty colleagues. And uh, it's a way to address the need that we've seen over the years as members of the Linguistics Beyond Academia Special Interest Group, which we'll introduce to you in just a moment. We've heard from faculty, we've heard from you, that you need to know what to tell students who are wondering, what can I do with that degree? Or what to respond to their parents when they ask. What are you gonna do with that degree? So we've put together some strategies and a mind shift that will be useful in addressing these career paths. Quick introduction for myself. My name is Alex Johnston. I got my PhD in linguistics in 2003. And I say that out loud to let you know that for all of those years, except for four, I have applied my linguistic skill set outside of academia. I've worked as a program director in several nonprofit organizations focused on international education. I've worked as a corporate training and development specialist. I've delivered my own modules on presentation skills, leadership skills, and more <laughs> to corporate clients in the agricultural and biosciences space, as well as financial services. So I've been the linguist in the room in many corporate spaces, applying everything I learned in sociolinguistics to help people in the corporate world move forward, communicate better with their colleagues, and learn some of the research behind the recommendations that I provide them to solve problems in their workplace. I currently work at Georgetown University. This is my fourth year as faculty in the Department of Linguistics. I teach sociolinguistics. I also direct a master's in language and communication, which is focused on applied sociolinguistics and preparing graduates for careers beyond academia in business, tech, government, and nonprofit organizations. So many of the suggestions that we'll be presenting to you in this and our following two hours will be based on this model of a graduate program that provides professional development and training for students and faculty who are curious about careers beyond academia. Uh, these are experiences that we have lived and that we want to share with you to inspire you to implement in your own departments and linguistics programs, whether you're a faculty, advisor, or a student. And now I'd like to turn to my co-presenter, Emily Pace, to give a self-introduction. Emily? Thanks so much, Alex. Um, so glad to be here with Alex today and the rest of the Linguistics Beyond Academia group, and so glad to be here with all of you who have uh, done this last minute switch over to Zoom so that we could get going with our presentation today. Uh, so as Alex said, my name is Emily Pace. Um, I also have a degree in linguistics, uh, you know, as is the point of our group. We're all linguists who work outside of academia. Uh, I have a master's degree where I had a focus on theoretical linguistics. Um, my undergrad degrees were in French and in Arabic. So, you know, got into linguistics through that language nerd route that a lot of us follow. Um, I've had some previous experience working at nonprofits in the DC area, government, uh, government association nonprofits and civic education. And then after getting my, my master's degree, I made a switch to working in the uh, NLP space. So I work for a company called Expert System USA that provides natural language processing products and solutions to customers in the US government space. Um, I'm the principal linguist, so I actually oversee a team 
of, of people with mostly linguistics degrees, but some with, with language studies backgrounds as well, um, who do the work of implementing the customized NLP projects that we deliver to our customers. And I think I'll keep my intro there for now and we can go ahead and move forward. And I'll tell you a little bit about the SIG. Um, you know, who, who are we? What are we doing here? So we represent the, the needs and the interests of anybody who's working outside of academia. And we say this thing outside of academia, but we mean inside lots of other spaces like industry, nonprofits, government, et cetera. Um, there is a wide, wide variety of space and careers out there for people who have linguistics degrees, and we are trying to help people understand what those spaces look like. So to that end, we execute a lot of different activities to support and engage our community, um, anybody who's looking for a career transition, anybody who just wants to explore, or even people who are in academic settings, but who are not on the, the tenure track. Um, you know, we, we see ourselves as strong advocates for anybody who is outside of that traditional tenure track role. And all of us who run the SIG, there are six of us that do this in a volunteer capacity. Uh, we all have careers. Uh, some of us have decades long careers. Some of us are newer out of school, uh, but we all have lots of experience working working beyond those traditional tenure line paths, um, but we welcome everybody here, even, even faculty, of course, who have followed that traditional path. We're here to try to make your job easier when it comes to advising your students on career possibilities. And we'll, I'll, I'll end just real quickly on this intro with uh, what we've been doing to help enact the LSA strategic plan, which is something you may or may not have seen. But one of the bullet points of that, and 2023 is coming up pretty, pretty soon, um, is to do more work to incorporate incorporate linguists who are working outside of these of these uh, traditional tenure track paths who are maybe not aware of LSA or outside of, of LSA in some way. The strategic plan is looking to bring some of those people back into what they're doing. So we see ourselves as a really important part of that. So I'll, I'll throw it back to Alex to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and what we've already done at the current annual meeting. We just wrapped a rather successful career mixer, I'd say. Some of you were able to join us in the past couple of hours in our room and gather. And if you feel like it, please put in the chat some of your takeaways, or if you met somebody who was in a career path that was of interest to you. We couldn't put on these career mixers without the community of linguists working in these other spaces, in business, in government, tech, and nonprofit. So we really rely on our colleagues and this tight-knit community to share expertise. In the next two hours, <laughs> just to preview our session for you, we will hear about the outcomes of the very successful July 2021 Linguistics Career Launch. You'll hear how we organized that first ever career boot camp designed specifically for linguists looking to position themselves competitively for jobs in these spaces. And then stay on for the third hour. I'll be back with my colleague Chris Stewart and we will talk about the basics of job hunting for jobs outside of academia. We'll leave you with some takeaways that you can get started with immediately. And then tomorrow, we'll have virtual mentoring in partnership with Coggle's pop-up mentoring program. That required a pre-registration so that you could be paired with a career linguist mentor. But that gather space will be open for pop-in office hours so you can talk with anyone. We'll be there. Uh, so please feel free to join us tomorrow between 12 and 2 Eastern in our gather space. Look for the office hours room and there'll be people there trying to direct traffic. Yes, and if one of our um, if one of our fellow SIG members could paste the the link to the uh, gather space with the password in the Zoom chat, just so people can have that, um, it's the same as the space for the mixer today. If you were able to attend it, um, so what are we? Why are what specifically are we are we looking at today? You know, we framed this 
uh, this talk as what faculty should know. And if you're faculty and you're here, we're so happy that you're that you're here to listen. But if you're a student and you're here, we want you to stay because we want you to know what we're telling to your faculty or what we think faculty should, how we think faculty should approach the job search process for their students and how they can best support you. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not trying to, um, if you're a faculty member who's here and you're a little bit nervous or maybe skeptical of, of this idea of, you know, having your students move outside of academia because it's not a space that you maybe know a lot about if you haven't done that yourself. Um, but we're not going to be framing this as a total radical readjustment, just trying to provide useful tips and useful ways to frame this that really will benefit you in the long run and, and really will help you as you move through um, advising students. And we're really going to try to hit on this idea that like something, anything has to be better than nothing. So if what your department is doing right now is not a lot in the way of support for students who are interested in pursuing those alternate paths, start with something, even if it's one thing a year, your students will really appreciate that. And so a lot of what we're putting out in terms of strategies are going to be low cost or no cost because we understand that for many departments that is a huge hurdle. And when we talk about this, this last point of, of being curious, you know, those of us who who have who have pursued um, who've pursued academic degrees, especially who've gone to grad school, you know, we're learners. That's part of why we we go into those paths and why we stay in school for longer. And so we want to really try to frame this as a, a learning experience and that bringing curiosity to the process is is something that's going to contribute to that saving of time and energy. So we'll just, I'll just hit real quick. Oh, Alex, do you want to go ahead and chime in on this one? Well, I was going to continue along the vein of reassurance okay. for, for our faculty colleagues. We're really not asking for a radical readjustment of your worldview. Um, I hope not. I think that this really will save time and energy if we direct you to some resources that you can use to then direct your students to resources. So we are not asking you to become an expert in all career possibilities or, or really any. Really, I view this as being kind of a, a traffic director. We want you to know where to go to find the resources in terms of, of people and um, learning experiences that you can direct your students to. And we're here to help direct you to those resources. So think of yourself as, as being that conduit to through which this information and resource uh, package can flow to your students. You don't have to worry about training your students to do a job outside of academia. You have enough to do already. Uh, believe me, I know it's enough to, to train graduate students, uh, especially to train a doctoral student over many years as an apprentice, as somebody who will become an assistant professor, perhaps. You don't have to train them to do those jobs in other spaces. Keep teaching them what you know, keep teaching them how to think. This is actually what employers outside of academia are looking for as well. They're looking for people who know how to think, how to communicate, keep teaching people how to write and communicate clearly, how to structure arguments, how to uh, develop their pattern analysis and systems thinking. These are all things that you're doing as part of your curriculum already. So it's not about training people to do other jobs in addition to learning how to be a professor uh, or learning how to function in the academic space. It's about uh, learning what, how they can apply those generalizable skills in other spaces and how to direct students towards those resources. So this isn't going to take a lot of effort on your part. I really want to reassure you about that because this is, this is what I do. I teach, I train, and I do all of these professional development activities with my students at Georgetown. So I hope we can uh, make this as not 
as an easy lift for you. And in addition, I think you'll find willing people in your department. Graduate students are very willing to join you in these efforts and can often take on these projects as part of their linguistic student association. So we'll be providing those types of strategies for you. The first thing, I'd just like to present some numbers and some data because we really wanna start from the same page of acknowledging explicitly the job market in academia, talking specifically uh, about linguists. So first of all, 60 to 70%, that is the percent of all instructional staff in higher education who are contingent. This is according to the American Association of University Professors, contingent being defined as full and part-time non-tenure line faculty, as well as adjuncts and lecturers, et cetera. So contingent faculty, non-tenure line faculty are the majority. And in some R1 institutions, they are on the higher end of that majority, closer to 70%. It really depends on the institution. But the takeaway here is that they're the majority. So your students don't have a lot of tenure line assistant professor opportunities to apply for. Looking at the NSF survey of earned doctorates by fine field of study, that's where you'll find the linguistics PhDs. So 327, that includes 232 PhDs in linguistics earned in 2020. In addition, 95 doctorates were earned in applied linguistics. So those two were separated out. What I'm ignoring here are 112 PhDs in cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics. I'm also ignoring here all the world languages PhDs, all the bilingual and multilingual education PhDs, all the rhetoric and communication PhDs. So <laughs> there's actually a lot more PhDs in this pool, more than 327 earned doctorates in linguistics fields in 2020. Now, and we're focusing on US only here, thank you. So I'm focusing on the US earned doctorates as well as the US market. So now I'm gonna to turn to the US market of jobs for tenure line assistant professors. And I want to acknowledge and shout out my fantastic research assistant, Helen Dominic, who helped do this tally. She pulled data from Linguist List, where most of our jobs are in academia are posted for linguists, right? And she pulled out the number of jobs for linguists in assistant professor rank. She ignored postdocs. She was just looking at assistant professor rank or open rank, which makes it even more difficult. And these include jobs in computational linguistics, sociolinguistics, theoretical linguistics, applied linguistics, and some of them also included other specialties. So linguistics and world language specialization required. So we are actually overcounting the number of jobs that were available. And in fact, doing a quick uh, redo of that tally based on all the positions that were available in the in the linguist list from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2021, there were really only about 51 of these job announcements available for linguists. Okay, so if we take these numbers, 42 available jobs, US-based, for assistant professor, 327 degrees, 12% get a TL job, that's the percentage, no. <laughs> because what usually happens is that People on the market in one year, of course, are competing with people who have received their PhDs between one and at least five years ago. So you're actually competing against a much larger pool. So I went through market years, just one through five, keeping these numbers constant. So just imagining that we have 327 linguistics PhDs being earned every year. Right now we are at a pretty consistent level of linguistics doctorates being awarded over time for the last 20 years, excuse me, last 10 years between 2010 and 2020. If we keep this number of open jobs constant too, let's just imagine that 42 new jobs become open every year. By year five on the market, there will be 
1,467 linguistics PhDs applying for these same 42 jobs. So that's about a 2.8% chance of getting a tenure line position. And that's ignoring extra institutional factors when it comes to getting a job. It's ignoring the prestige, prestige of that uh, PhD program because that matters who gets placed in a tenure line job. It's ignoring the fact that most people who are placed have a parent who was a PhD. There's some very good uh, work done on um, that that I can post a link to later when we share this video. And again, it's also very possible, it's very difficult to move horizontally once you get those tenure line positions. So I just want to start out with this reality check. Students are aware of this. And if you say that, yes, we know the market is bad, but you know, you'll get one. It's ignoring this almost lottery system that we have in place now, how difficult it is for a PhD graduate to get a tenure line job. It's raising false hope. I believe that we need to be very transparent about these numbers and don't raise that false hope. We do have hope to offer though, because right now there are people with linguistics PhDs, masters and BA degrees who are getting jobs outside of academia in fields that are growing and where people can pursue very fulfilling careers outside of academia and do everything that we do inside academia. You can do research, teaching, mentorship, administration, whatever you like outside of academia as well. So that's what we'll be focusing on um, in our later slides. So, you know, we, we, we brought up earlier this idea of like something is better than nothing. This, this actually started off internally as like something can't be worse than nothing. So, you know, just starting off with whatever you can to, to help your students. And the first thing is acknowledging those realities that Alex has just beautifully broken down and, and detailed for us. Um, you know, telling, telling your students that like, really, you'll get it, you'll be that 2.8% is, is likely not going to be true, you know, based on the math and is going to just be absolutely crushing if, if that's what they're being told, that they will be the exception. And so that's why we say starting off with checking in with your students in a non-judgmental way. And, and this is where we get to the idea of you know, you don't need to know anything about jobs or job hunting or the job market outside of academia to be able to ask people questions, to ask your students, how is your job search going? What kinds of roles are you finding? And, and that sort of, you know, just listening to the things that they tell you in response to these, these um, you know, very basic questions. If you're a student, uh, we would add in a little bit of advice uh, that Ann Kruk, who presented our, at our summer program, talked about, and uh, uh, you can find her video on our YouTube channel, where, you know, we, we absolutely understand in these conversations that it's important to acknowledge that not, not all advisors are open to hearing this stuff. So, you know, if you're not sure if your advisor is open to your exploration of careers outside of, of academia, asking their other mentees, asking around to other students in the department to try to understand if they're open to that conversation, um, that can be an important step in initiating that as a student. And if your advisor is not supportive, seek out another faculty member or fellow grad students who are doing the same thing to talk to them and share what you're learning with them to try to build that career community with your fellow students if, if you're not getting the support that you need from your faculty. But again, we would go back to the, to, you know, back to the faculty perspective that anything is better than, than nothing and, and just start with a small step like listening to your students and being judge, non-judgmental and reflecting probably on how non-judgmental you might be in that 
interaction. Um, and the Ann Kruk talk that Nancy has just posted in the Zoom chat here from our YouTube channel has some has some great additional points about that um, that judgment side of it and, and that approach to it. So I think we can we can go on to start talking a little bit about some no cost strategies. Um, and I'll, I'll turn this back over to Alex because she does this. She tracks job placements and she connects with her students. Yes, I love this data. I have historical placement data for all of the graduates of the master's program I direct going back to the <laughs> beginning of that program. You're one of that program. I've tracked them over time for the past 14 years. And this is incredibly useful data that you can also uh, use to your advantage. And this is part of the time savings that will help you later. So track people's, track your graduates job placements. Uh, you can ideally do this before they graduate so that you, you have them on site. You can find out where they are taking their next step. And then connect with those students on LinkedIn. Uh, putting up a, a bare bones LinkedIn profile is uh, very easy to do if you don't have one as a faculty member. It's a great way to stay in contact with your students who go into positions outside of academia. It's where that networking and where research about these career pathways happens. So it's the place to be in order to know where to go, know where to do some research, know where to find people. And people, this is key, finding people and connecting with them will be key to supporting your own students and to widening your own professional network. It can uh, be useful to you actually when you do your research in terms of finding people to collaborate with or to you know, pilot work with. Also, don't forget the students who did not complete a graduate program, even a BA program, those ABD students, those who received a master's in passing or who left their master's program, they're still out there using linguistics. Those ABDs who haven't communicated with their departments in, and are dragging out their dissertations, you will find them on LinkedIn because they have full-time jobs for the most part working in their field. That's the first place to go check if you haven't been able to get a check-in from your student. Um, it's not that they're doing nothing. It's not like they're not working uh, just because they're not progressing on their dissertation. They are likely putting those skills that you uh, train them in to use out in the business world. So these aren't lost causes. These aren't people who have necessarily left the field keep track of them, just connect with them on LinkedIn so you can follow their progression. And having that circle of former students and graduates and people who didn't graduate, that's gonna be like this seed community from which you can draw in order to get somebody to come back to your department to give a talk about their career path, to teach your students how they got that job specifically. How did they write their resume? How did they make the connections that they made to get that job? Uh, they'll be the teachers for those career pathways outside of academia. And all you have to do is just connect with them and keep them in the fold. Uh, then you can just tap them to come back. Alumni love to come back and talk. They love it. <laughs> um, and, and keeping those connections will really redound. It's investment now that will pay off later. And I, I also want to emphasize that you really want to value all of your students' next steps post-graduation, not just the ones who got those postdocs or tenure line positions. List all of those job placements on your department and program website. This sends a message not only to those graduates, but also to people who are prospective applicants to your program. They notice, believe me, they notice the placement data uh, and where the graduates go. And it's often what draws them to a program when they see that diversity of placement, uh, that is a draw, not uh, something to you know, be repelled by. There are students who do come in and they are dead set on a career as a professor. And that's wonderful. Like we're agnostic about all of these career types, uh, but it is reassuring to even those students who are set on an academic career to know that there are other options 
and to know that their cohort will likely go on to other types of ways of applying their linguistic skills. Put those I, can, I, can I chime in with a really quick story here, Alex, about, about what she just said, which is um, I, I, I've heard from somebody previously who is now in a, a tenure track position um, but who came to Linguistics Beyond Academia stuff, how valuable that programming was to her during her, her search for a job in academia because she knew that there were other options that were good. And it meant that she did not devalue herself during the search for a tenure track position. So, you know, she went that more traditional route, but she went with knowing that there was a viable black backup plan. She didn't need to postdoc or adjunct for years and hold out hope of getting that academic position. She could advocate for herself strongly in academia because if it didn't work out, she knew that there were other options. And so, you know, I think that goes to, to what Alex is saying that, that we, we are totally, we are totally supportive of people who want to follow that. And we see you know, these types of discussions as helping give them more power in those searches, even if they're staying in academia. Absolutely. So showing that your department or program values all types of placement is necessary reassurance to students in a volatile job market like we've never seen before. The job market is now, now is not what it was five years ago. Uh, it's not what it was when you entered the market. Um, even if you entered the market just a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, it's just changing all the time. It's very rapid. So please provide that reassurance to students and show them both, you know, through digital representation as well as some sort of physical representation in your department. You know, this is where people are placed. This is your community. These are people that you can connect with and get some reassurance from. And rest assured, I will post that information that's asked for in the, in the chat later. More low, no cost strategies. We recommend that you host a video watch party with the videos that we already have on the Linguistics Career Launch YouTube channel, which cover the gamut of career management videos, prepping students about how to write their resumes, how to write cover letters, how to network two specific examples of people working outside of academia in educational technology, user experience research and design, text to talk, text to speech. It runs the gamut, strategic communications. You can find almost any type of career path represented in these videos and we are posting more and more by the day. So just pick an interesting talk, watch it with your students and have a discussion afterwards. So you don't even have to get a speaker to come. You can watch these videos and have a, a discussion and even have it be a springboard for a workshop for everybody to try and use the tips for creating a resume together and then share with one another, how that resume goes. So that is part of, you know, facilitating a very supportive career community where students can help one another. And, you know, once you provide some of these resources, then they can take it to Google. They can take it to, you know, their own, um, you know, student linguistic association meetups and work on these, these career activities. Here's some low cost strategies. Career talks by alumni, as I said earlier, alumni love to come back and share their experience. It makes them feel like they're still part of their alma mater. Uh, so please invite them back, but please do pay an honoraria to recognize their time and energy, especially they're out in the, the working world and they're, they're recognized uh, with honoraria for their um, extra labor put together a career panel. And we have some models in our YouTube videos of these types of career panels. You can invite three or four people from a specific sector, whether it's user experience, whether it's human language technology, whether it's uh, working in a nonprofit organization or in naming and branding, get a few people together focused on a specific career sector and have them talk about their career paths or organize it around a specific uh, topic related to being in the workplace. Um, so specific issues related to people from marginalized backgrounds. 
for example. Um, and then if you're feeling ambitious, look through your graduates, your people who got masters in passing, invite them to come to a career mixer if they're applying their skills outside of academia. Reach out to them on LinkedIn and have them have a join for a virtual career mixer um, hosted by your program. Uh, that's just a that's a very easy way that you can get people together to talk about strategies and to connect and you know find their next step. Anytime you can widen a student's professional network, that increases the opportunity that they can learn more about different jobs, different pathways, meet new people. This is how you need to, this is how you get a job is by meeting people. And, and not only how you get a job, but also how those of us who are already in industry find new students to connect with, to bring into our companies and, and give them jobs. So just wanna plug the, the, another part of the reason why alumni like to come back, they like to, to meet the current students from their program and, and help bring those people into their own companies. Um, and, and so we've, we've hit on this a few times and we're going to hit on it again because it's just so important to, to be curious in the career exploration process, you know, learn from your students. It is totally okay if you do not have this expertise, why, why anybody would expect you to have expertise in something completely different in a totally different realm, totally different types of jobs and a different way of working, you know, that, that does not make sense to me at least. Um, and, and we, you know, so we want to encourage that just like asking those questions, learning what job titles your students have. And all of this connects back to what Alex was talking about in terms of tracking students, connecting with them on LinkedIn, you know, that helps you put together and information and, and pass that on um, to your students. Um, so we'll go, Alex, if we could go to the next one, we wanna talk a little bit about framing because this is so important. Careers, and I'm, I'm gonna read this as it is on the slide because I think this is so crucial. Careers beyond tenure line academia are not second best. They are not something to pity. They are not a necessary evil and they are not selling out. You know, even taking out of this, the realities of the academic job market, not everybody wants to be in academia and that is also okay. And when it comes to your students looking for their career path, and looking for jobs, their loyalty has to be to themselves. Their loyalty cannot be to their degree, to their department, or to their advisor. It needs to be to them what they want out of their life professionally and what they want out of their life personally. You know, if going outside of academia is going to provide an individual with the life that they want because they're going to be able to live in the geographic area that they want to live in that's you know that is their if that's their primary motivation we really encourage you to be supportive of that and not say things like oh it's too bad that you're leaving but to understand all of the personal reasons that people might make this other choice from I can't find a tenure track job, even though I would like it to, I just don't want to, to I think outside of academia is more interesting. Whatever their reasons are as an individual are completely valid. And we, we encourage faculty to support that. And students, if that's not what you're hearing from your faculty, you know, connect with us because we have a hugely supportive community of, of linguists who will tell you that it's okay to want something different from what your advisor is indicating. I'd like to also touch on that metaphor of leaving, which is so often leaving. used when, yeah, leaving. Leave. Abandonment. Yeah, well, you know, we, we tend to use this without thinking, but let's be mindful of that language and question those metaphors. I would say, you know, when you're trained as a linguist, um, even up to our terminal degree of a PhD, if you get a job that's outside of academia, whether it's contingent, whether it's tenure line, um, 
you're not you're not leaving. You're still part of the community of linguists. And also, careers, we hope, are long. And that boundary between academic and alt academic jobs is actually kind of porous, well, especially on the contingent side of higher education uh, instructional staff positions, but you never know what will happen. A student may you know, start out with a career in UX design or conversation design, and then at some point be hired back into academia as a professor of the practice, as instructional faculty of some sort. Um, there are ways to incorporate both academic positions and these other positions outside of academia and really have them weave into one another, have them you know, be, become a, a synergy of experience and ideas. So remember, you know, you're, you're not losing people. You've always had the students that you've, you've trained and they're still a part of your community and they need to hear that type of metaphor of inclusivity and not that they're going away, leaving, abandoning, dropping out. Uh, we wanna keep them together with us, you know, from, some of us have been on that other side when we've taken those jobs beyond academia and uh, felt that we weren't part of our academic communities anymore and it can feel really lonely. Um, so let's, let's err on the side of inclusivity. And just try also not to take it personally as an advisor. Uh, it's really, it's not about you. It's the system, it's the structure, it's the academic market, it's the entire market of jobs and the economy that we have right now. Uh, so it's not a repudiation of you. It's not a rejection of you and all that you have learned and all that you have taught. Not at all. It's, it's really the structure that we have. And it's also about that individual student and what they want and need. So they have, they have gotten something from you as a faculty, as an advisor, uh, that they will retain for their life and that they will apply. So, you know, remember again, that you're not losing them and they're not losing what you have given them. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like you never know when people will come back to you, academia. You, you don't. And, and you also, you know, you never, you never know how that can develop over, over time in terms of the relationships that your, your students will have to each other and that they might, you know, it's, your students might reach back out to you in the future for help with finding other people to, to talk to. You know, they're, they're looking to hire somebody for their team or they're looking for somebody to, to help with some specific knowledge. You know, so what Alex is talking about, it's just this, this long, long reaching, long armed network that, that we think is so important for everybody to have and, and that we want faculty to be building those, you know, for themselves and for their students. Exactly, exactly. So again, you know, keeping that very open mindset, the non-judgmental mindset now and investing just a little bit of time, maybe setting up your LinkedIn profile or connecting with those students who have already graduated or uh, left your program, that's, that will pay off. Uh, and it's an investment in your, your long-term uh, career as an advisor and as someone who can connect your students and keep building community with them. So with just the few minutes left before the hour, we're gonna leave you with some resources and we'll keep, many of these have been posted in the chat already. I want to just remind you that at your own universities, you have many career centers uh, like but possibly, at least you'll have one career center, you'll likely have an alumni career center, make use of those resources, familiar, familiarize yourself with them. You can often uh, direct students to those resources, they don't make use of them from day one. So encourage them to, uh, tell them to build in time for professional development and familiarize themselves with career centers. Tell them to make use of Handshake, which is a job application portal that is offered through many universities. Tell them to explore FirstHand, which was formerly known as Vault. That's a place to research careers and positions and what, what positions are you know, exploding in popularity and growing and what positions are shrinking. And also 
get them to start their own LinkedIn profiles and start building that community. So for some takeaways, please just be open to any kind of application of linguistics, even if it's not something that you're familiar with yourself. And think that in the big world of employment, they might be the only linguist on a team or in a company. I've been that person before many times. Uh, so think of those lone linguists out there as being ambassadors for our field and you know, doing some of that work for you in terms of learning about these careers and then conveying that information back to you and your department and program. And again, please be agnostic about those career paths in terms of being non-judgmental. There's no objective better or worse. It's just fit for that student. And do what you can and, and be curious. I would love to open this up for some discussion. So if you want to unmute or wave your hand, we'd love to get to questions. I'll stop sharing for a minute so that we can. I just wanna say we wanna, I, I loved how you uh, did this version of the talk. I know we've done pieces of it before and I can put myself on video, but I also wanna give people a, a, a passing period. And I know we have invited comments in the chat and haven't gotten a lot of traction. Maybe everybody's here for the duration and that's great. Great, well, we, we do hope that you'll stick with us for the duration. We'll allow a couple minutes for speaker changeover and uh, get to any questions in the chat. Emily, if you would like to take any chat questions, please. I did see one um, one question earlier, which is what's, what's the best way to contact people? LinkedIn. So if you're interested in connecting with any of, uh, with Alex or myself or any of the panelists you've seen today, um, connecting, find us on LinkedIn. And it's always great when making a LinkedIn connection to personalize that note and say, hey, I saw you give this talk. I met you at this event. Um, that'll help reinforce that network that you're trying to build. And it looks like we have a question from Brendan. Yeah, you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I, I do apologize. I missed the first 30 or so minutes because I couldn't find the Zoom room thanks to the the non-streaming part. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you for, for re-putting those in. Finally, the chat showed up. So I am sorry I missed the first half of this, but I just, this is, this is awesome. Um, I think I th just, I don't, I don't have a question. I'm just really pumped that this is here, which is how I, was, I, I literally waited 30 minutes refreshing, but come on, surely it's going to We're work. really pumped that you're here. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I just, everything that you're saying uh, this, like, I mean, it's very much, I think the, the narrative, uh, and I really appreciate everything you had to say of, of the narrative must change, right? The job market is so distinct. Um, and so I think it's really exciting, right? That, that y'all are putting this out there. And I think it's up to us in the programs, right? To, to, to change that narrative. And I think, like you said, it, it, I know at Georgetown, y'all are awesome at discourse analysis among many other things, but yeah, the language that we use when someone goes outside of uh, that. Yeah, I, I think it's really important and, and not just, I don't want to be agnostic. I want to be super excited when they go into industry. So I just want to say thank you all for everything you're doing. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. So I was a little late. No worries, Brendan. We'll make sure that you get the recordings and we'll connect later too. Yeah, the recording will be added to our YouTube channel under Linguistics Career Launch. So if you would like to check check it out later, if you miss part of it, or come revisit the conversation that Alex and I have had, or the other sessions, that'll be on our YouTube channel. And you can access our slides now because we've shared a drive link that has the slides for all three hours of our symposium today. So if you are curious about what we talked about in the beginning, you can. All right, good, you got it. Great. Any other questions or comments? I'll add just one thing about the slides for people that might be helpful because it seems like people have gotten that that link to the drive that has our that deck has our website, YouTube channel, email, ways to connect with us. So definitely check out that deck. Um, yes, we can definitely repost the slide link. And it looks like Valerie has a question. Well, I suppose it's more of a comment, but for the, the those numbers that you shared were really illuminating. I know. Do you turn on? Um, oh,
um, that the, the numbers are really illuminating that something, you know, like only three to 12% of students that we are graduating with PhDs are going to become like us and uh, have even a chance of getting a similar job. Um, and I think that, you know, those of us who got our jobs in the last few years are well aware of this, but our older colleagues mm. had a much better situation and they may not be aware of this. And so, um, like ha having kind of those numbers to bring, to help encourage our colleagues to look at things differently, um, that, that it's something that's really important for departments to, uh, as, a, as a part of mentoring that our, you know, that we and our older, older colleagues uh, need to learn what the situation is really like so that we can advise our students better and shift that, shift the way that we think about what's, um, an important job, a good job, you know, that that non-tenure track is not second best and selling out and those things. We can't possibly expect all of our students to be in that 3%. So we have to, you know, <laughs> um, so thank you for digging up those numbers. Thank you. That was, that was my math and I take responsibility for it. It was an <laughs> intentional undercount of PhDs and an intentional overcount of jobs. Uh, so it's the numbers are actually even smaller, uh, but it is it is a very different job market. And I, I also am not counting failed searches that happens. Um, I think studies that were done in there's a there was a study done on humanities that showed, you know, some like a third of jobs ended up in a failed search. So we have to account for that as well. And I'm just going to make one plug to Valerie's point about trying to change, you know, the minds of other other faculty members. I'm going to add a couple of posters that we've put together previously to that Google Drive folder, um, po a poster about how to talk to students about careers and a poster on how faculty can improve the job search process. Um, we put those together in 2019. They're still relevant today. Um, and so if you're faculty looking to make some change, we, we recommend using these posters as one of the tools available to you. They're still relevant today, except of course, we chose a format and technology that was designed for being together in a hallway. That's true. <laughs> that, that is true. So other than that, other than the pandemic, all of the advice is still relevant. <laughs> content is good. The content is good. The content the is great. Now.